When I was 12 years old, I needed a, un a school uniform. My father bought the material and the only tailor in our neighborhood was a man. That was bad luck because we all heard stories of male tailors having a special fitting room where they did bad things to women. So I took all my precautions and went to visit him with my father and wearing shorts underneath my African skirt as I was taught. He measured me in front of my dad and I could see he was not happy. Unfortunately, as early as middle school or younger, girls are already praised to whomever is watching out there. A few days later, on my way to the market, I stopped by to fetch my uniform as agreed. But he told me that he hadn't finished it yet, that he needed to measure me some more. This time, I was alone. I was really taken aback, cornered, really. And school was starting soon and I needed the uniform. I was also too afraid to stand up against this man. So I entered the evil feeding room. He measured me again, and as I feared, he inappropriately touched me. I jumped out of the room, ashamed, angry, confused, and guilty of somehow having done something wrong. By his smug smile, I could see he had won. I learned that day that my earthly father, my wonderful and well-respected Papa Jacques, could not protect me all the time, but God will always be with me. From that day forward, I always wore shorts for every tailor's visit, even when I needed only to pick up my clothes. Actually, it has become like a trend with many women in Congo wearing shorts under their skirts because you never know when a man will corner you somewhere and try to hurt you. Let's have a word of prayer. Abba, this is a time of lament when we cry out to you and bring our sorrows, sadness, pains, losses, and griefs. Be with us and move in our midst. In your name we pray, amen. I am grateful for the Me Too movement that has brought the suffering of women and men more to the forefront in the past few years. Congo, like many African countries, is a patriarchal society. Therefore, in general, men are regarded as more important than women. As a consequence, Congolese women in particular and African women in general experience all sorts of violence in their lives. In many African countries, governments started taking measures to help fight gender-based violence. In Congo Brazzaville, where I'm originally from, many laws were signed. The Penal Code in ten, uh, 1810, the Family Code in 1918, the Child Protection Act in 2010, but they are rarely implemented. And many women, especially those living in rural areas, are not even aware that there are laws to protect them. In 2013, two ONGs, Azure Développement and Association pour le Progrès des Communications, started to educate women on their rights. The Evangelical Church of Congo, for example, has appointed a committee to look into allegations of violence. Church members are being trained so they can help victims of abuse. Many African governments, including the Republic of Congo, have signed and ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. But the progress is very slow. Regina Matengo is from Malawi, and responding to my question about abuse of women in her country, she said this, most parts of Malawi are patriarchal and therefore women are treated as second-class citizens. In 2018, the country conducted a nationwide campaign against gender-based violence in the workplace. Meetings conducted during this time revealed that there is a lot of violence against women during or after interviews sexual violence against domestic workers, lecturer, students, sexual violence, and less response mechanisms." End of quote. Many African sisters are suffering. I stand here representing suffering sisters who would like to be heard but cannot be here, a voice for those who have been silenced or ignored. I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to share today. I would like to start by saying that I'm grateful for the person I am today because of my Congolese roots and heritage. I learned the value of family, community, hospitality, and the resiliency in the face of hardship. Congo, 
And most of Africa has a very real sense of gender work distribution. And I think in many cases, the sense of imbalance starts here. In the village, for example, women take care of sowing, um, sowing the food, planting, weeding, harvesting, and cooking the food. Men take care of the initial big weeds and cut the big trees and hunting. So both men and women will come from the field, very tired and hungry. The man will shower using the water that the wife fetched from the river and then relax until it's time to eat. The woman cooks, feeds the family, and then she can eat, take care of the home, and finally shower and fall in bed exhausted. But the imbalance in the gender division of labor starts at a younger age, where little girls are expected to take care of household chores, while little boys just sit and wait to be served. I believe that help from husbands and brothers will make a great difference in the lives of women and correct some of the inequalities. It did for us. In our home, my brothers were expected to help with their share of household chores, which they did. And during war, my brothers helped us fetch water from the well and carry lumber from the forest. They did it even though some people made fun of them for doing women's work. I tell people that my dad, Papa Jacques, was a complementarian by culture and an egalitarian by heart. In the privacy of our home, he cooked for his family, helped us, especially when my mom was sick. And I have to say, he was a very good cook. This gender division of labor shaped the way girls and boys had access to education. During my growing up years, young men were encouraged to pursue schooling as far as they can go. Young women were encouraged to get enough schooling to find a job and then get married. My father encouraged us all children to give our best to school. When I studied college in Brazzaville, my parents lived in Dolizi, a city in the south of Congo. I loved school and my goal was to go as far as possible in my studies. One summer holiday, while I was home to visit my family, my great aunt Henriette came with her nephew and other people to ask for my hand in marriage. The young man was very handsome, not as handsome as Craig, and polished, but I didn't know him. I've never met him. He worked in Pointe Noire, the second largest city in Congo, and seemed to be financially well off, which was and still is a big plus in many families. But I wondered, who is this person? Does he even know Jesus as his savior? Now, for my parents, this looked like a great opportunity since they had two unmarried daughters over the age of 18. As it is done in Congo, the adults talked among themselves and they presented the situation to my folks. And in discussions like these, women are usually silent. They're not expected to participate unless asked to respond to a particular question. So my father's response took everyone by surprise. He told them that the final say belongs to Medin. Then he called me aside and he told me, Medin, a man who puts forth material possessions before the welfare of others is not a man who will take care of you as a person created in the image of God. That's all I needed to hear because in my heart, there was no way I was going to marry this person that I didn't even know. So when asked to give my answer, I explained that I wanted to continue my studies. Of course, the young man didn't want a wife who will be going to school. Once married, I was supposed to settle down and have children. After all, he was going to pay the bride price in some other countries, it's called the dowry, and he did not want to pay for a wife with too much schooling. So he did not marry me. My father was different. He believed in equal opportunities and respect for both men and women. Many young women did not have the same fortune I had and they found themselves being married to men they did not like and sometimes did not know. This happens in other countries too. Mama Liba was born in the Maasai territory in Kenya, one of 11 children born into a household where the alcoholic father ruled. She was married off to an alcoholic man when her father accepted a dowry. She is regularly beaten by her husband, 
despite the fact that her mother-in-law has moved into the house to help protect her and her seven children. Mama Liba stays in the marriage because of her children. My friend Joe Brocious, who interviewed Mama Liba, says that, quote, Mama Liba has endured the abuse in her marriage for more than 20 years and has seven children who she says are the light of her life. She hopes one day that God will change her husband. She goes to her Baptist church and draws strength to endure from God who gives her hope." End of quote. When a young woman marries a man who paid for the bride price and sees her as an asset to have children, that frame of mind sometimes is not conducive to mutual love and respect. When people get married in Congo Brazzaville, the future husband and his family must pay for the bride price. And the more educated and beautiful the woman is, the more money you pay. When Craig married me, for example, my relatives came to my dad and told him that they were going to ask for a lot of money from this white man. He's American, they said. And there is a saying in Congo that in America, money grows in trees. But my dad's response was, Medin is not for sale. Instead of Craig paying like $800 or $1,000, he paid about $250. Most of it went to satisfy greedy relatives, not my immediate family. The custom of bride price was originally a way for brides' families to be recompensed and for people to know that the young woman belonged to someone else, like the betrothal in the Bible, since people did not use rings for marriage. It was a way for the groom's family to express their gratitude for the gift of a bride. Now greediness has turned it into a way of selling helpless young women into loveless marriages or worse. In the Evangelical Church of Congo, many young women are living with partners without getting married, so they're living in sin because the dowry is very expensive. People rarely pay the official 50,000 francs, which is about $30 bride price, that is the government's requirement. Because of the bride price, a lot of men think that they are entitled to their wife's body, mind, and soul. And when the wife doesn't really cooperate, they remind them by, they remind them that they paid. One way to do that is to beat them or mistreat them, withdraw or force sexual intimacy, and so on. Out of that custom, many practices demeaning women were started in Africa. One of them is girl brides. In some tribes in Congo Brazzaville, when a baby was born, a man could put a bracelet on her wrist and let her be raised as his future bride or his son's future bride. Her fate was sealed as soon as her life started. In Nigeria, girl brides is officially an illegal practice that girls as young as 12 years old are sold to older men to have kids that the husband can sell if he so chooses. It is called money marriage as opposed to love marriage. People sell their daughters or granddaughters to repay debts. The girls become properties to the man who buys them. They do not go to school. They are worked as hard as slaves and are beaten when they do not co cooperate. They have complications with childbirth being so young. In September 16, 2018, a video entitled Money Wives, the Nigerian Girls Sold to Repay Debts was aired in the BBC News Africa. It tells the story of missionary Richard Akonam from Nigeria, who is trying to help girl brides in the Bichivi community, a stronghold of money wives in Nigeria. The story was picked up the next day by the Nigerian media, and in May 2020, the male leaders of the Bichivi community committed themselves to preventing violence against women and girls. Thank God that BBC aired that story and some young women's lives were changed. In Zimbabwe, says my friend Martha, when a family is poor, a young girl or young woman is given to an older man in marriage for the family to get food and money to sustain the poor family. They become wives at a tender age and without their consent. 
The girls in these instances are forced to comply and marry men they are also are men who are also older than their fathers and even older than their, gr their grandfathers. This kind of abuse leads the girls to polygamous families where they become wife number three or wife number five or wife number 10. In Ethiopia, another practice, which is br bride kidnapping, forces young girls to be shackled for life to men that they do not know. A girl as young as eight can be kidnapped by a man who wants her for a wife, raped in front of his family, and married the next day. Her parents will not take her back because she has been used sexually and becomes damaged goods. In a relationship where girls and women have no voice, physical abuse becomes a big problem. In Congo, many battered women do not share easily what's going on in their lives. I discovered their world by becoming one of them. I knew them and some of what they experienced, but I did not know how to connect with or help them other than praying once in a while. When I lived in Brazzaville, it was a common scene to see a man beating a woman in the street and I used to feel helpless and angry. How did I become one of them? I'm glad you asked. I was born and raised in a family that was Christian. I have never been abused by my parents. All I received from them was loving discipline and encouragement to be the best I can be with God's help and grace. Then I got married to a man from Congo. Now this is not Craig Kina. I got married to a man from Congo. After a couple of months into the marriage, things went south. Emotional and verbal abuse. I was called stupid, whore, and all the low names. I also experienced forced sexual intercourse from my then husband. When sex is coerced upon a woman, taken without consent, that's rape. And this man became so bold that he will bring his mistress into my house and eat my food. And then the day came when he strangled me, five months pregnant me. Only the voice of someone in the street saying my name saved me from passing out. My throat hurt, but my heart hurt even more. And his parting words that day chilled me to the bone. He said, I will know that I have hurt you when you find yourself in the hospital with a hand or a leg missing. I knew I was in trouble. That day, I finally confided in my best friend, Julienne, because I knew she was beaten by her husband and I was safe talking to her. She would understand me. And her answer started my way out of silence to understanding and freedom. She said, Medin, you're not stupid like he says. For heaven's sake, you have a PhD just like he has. And you're not a prostitute like he insinuates. You've never had sex until you married him, remember? And I went, oh yes, you're right. Light bulb coming up, fog clearing. People who are abused need someone to talk to, someone who will listen. I pray that the Church of Jesus Christ will become that listening ear to a hurting soul, a safe place. Then Julian said, you are a precious child of God. That spoke to me strongly. I remembered my true identity in Christ. And as I started to share with other women, I discovered some of the horrors that married and single women are subjected to by their husbands or partners. Sometimes when a husband wants an heir and the wife isn't able to give him a son, they seek a deuxième bureau or troisième bureau. So second office or third office, uh, that's how we call them. It's usually a younger woman who can produce an heir. They either marry the woman, polygamy is legal in Congo, or take her as a mistress. I lived with one of my dad's friends when I was studying in another town. He had six beautiful daughters, but no son. He had an affair to try to secure the birth of a son. Fortunately for his wife, I hope, um, her seventh pregnancy yielded a son and she was able to stay married to him. Infertility has also been a cause of violence against women. Many black women suffer from fibroids and that prevents them from conceiving. In some tribes in Congo, it is encouraged to live together and make sure the woman produces a child before marrying her. 
So if the woman is having problems getting pregnant, she's cast out and another one replaces her. In an article in 1998, a Zimbabwean journalist tells the story of Betty Shishava, who struggled with infertility all her life. Betty endured public ostracism by relatives, friends, and her husband. Her parents even tried to persuade her to sleep with her brother-in-law to produce a child in case the husband was at fault. But because of her faith in God, she refused and endured 26 years of verbal abuse until she created her association to help other women and herself face infertility and try to find solutions to it. In many cases in Congo and other African countries, the success of a marriage depends on the ability for the wife to conceive. When a woman loses her husband, her plight can be as precarious as that of a barren wife. When the husband dies in Congo, the widow is expected to marry the dead husband's brother or nephew, a little bit like the Leveret law in the Bible, so that the material possessions will stay in the family. Papa Jacques was asked to marry his brother's widow. As a Christian man, he faced a dilemma. What to do? Become a polygamous or break traditions? Papa Jacques did not marry his brother's widow, but even though he stood up against that tradition, he offered a solution. He gave her the freedom to marry whomever she wanted. When she refused, he offered to provide for her and her children, which he did all her life. When it was time for Papa Jacques to go to his heavenly father, he made provisions for my mom by saying, this house is for my wife in front of witnesses, so no one could remove her from there. Now, in another part of Africa, in Kenya, cleansing rites for many widows involve having self sex with a man who will inherit her, or with any man. This tradition is believed to chase away demons and protect the widow's family. If the widow refuses, tradition says one of her sons will die. What mother will let her own child die? And in the villages, of course, many of these widows are not educated and they believe the tradition. So it's practically forcing these women to be raped by a stranger or someone from the family. Consequences are HIV AIDS, unwanted pregnancies, and poverty. Women are now fighting against this practice in Kenya. Sexual harassment in all of its form demeans those who are subjected to it, women or men. Congolese women have been victims of sexual harassment and sexual violence for a long time. And because this was a taboo, women rarely talked about it. Sex for grade, for example, or what is it's called in Zimbabwe, a thigh for pass, um, has been going on for years in many schools in Africa. Professor Eddy, this is not his real name, was one of my professors at the University of Brazzaville. The university nickname at that time was the Empire of Evil. That gives you an idea of the dark environment in, it represented for anyone who wanted to live a simple and pure life. After a few weeks into the semester, I realized that Prof. Eddy has set his eyes on me. That did not bode well with me. I prayed for protection daily. Things became so bad that when I or other female students will come to class a little late, he will whistle and make remarks that will make any woman blush. It's a good thing that, well, black women, when they blush, you do not see it. I hope so. But anyway, then I started to notice that this professor walked in my neighborhood. I will hide inside my apartment praying that he didn't see me. My inside was a knot of anxiety as the semester was drawing to the end. Professors waited for their praise during the oral exam. Even though my grades were very bad, according to him, for all class assignments, I did excellently well during the midterm and final exams because the names were hidden. The oral exam was the deciding factor for me to pass the class. The miracle came for me that semester and continued through my years at the University of Brazzaville. We had two professors giving us the oral exam. The list was divided into by the administrative assistant. Every time Prof. Eddy had the first half of the list, 
My name, Musunga, was the first one on the second half. And every time he had the second half of the list, my name was the last one on the first half. I never had the oral exam with him. The last time we met, it was in France. I met him in the metro, on the metro in Paris with two of his former students. And I will never forget what he told me. He looked at me and said, quote, Musunga, your God is alive. End of quote. He acknowledged that my Jesus protected me from being sexually harassed by him. Amen and amen to Jesus. Now I have to say that male students were harassed too. And most of the time because they tried to protect a female student. One of Elisea's friend was a beautiful young woman at the university, and she was the focus of a professor's interest. The professor decided to fail Elisea in his class and talked to his colleagues to do the same to him. Discouraged, Elisea left the university for a year, and that gave the professor room to keep reeling in the young woman to his bed. One of my inspiration to fight against sexual harassment in Congo is a young woman called Emilienne Mbongo Muyabi. She received the call to serve the Lord at an early age and focused on school to make it one day to seminary. In 1972, at age 15, she finished her primary school with flying colors, eager to start middle school. Remember, sometimes girls started school later as they were needed at home to help with chores. After two years in middle school, Emilienne was weary of being courted by teachers. Sex for grades has caused many young women to end up with sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, and a troubled life of sexual promiscuity ahead. It is a practice that reduces girls and women to object and block them from pursuing their studies in peace. It also inculcates in their heads that they are not smart enough to do, it, to do well on their own, that they need to exchange sexual favors for grades. Emilienne realized that she was no match for these teachers who wanted to have sex with her. She knew that as a child of God, giving in was not for her. So she decided to quit school instead of compromising her integrity. She took the only decision that was within her reach to fight against the practice that degrades women. Emilienne's courage and obedience to the Lord in a situation where there was no human help did not prevent her from serving God. Her story is found online in the Dictionary of African Biography. This practice of sex for grades also extends to the workplace, sex for favor, Male bosses and sometimes fellow workers will expect women to have sex for a promotion or training. This type of behavior coming from men they know and even respect goes unreported so that these women will keep their jobs and get the promotion they need. As a war refugee, one of my greatest fears was to be raped. Rape is used as a weapon of terror. In one of the villages we stayed, a young woman from the north who had run with friends and found refuge in the South was gang raped by soldiers. And none of us could help because they had guns and they were going to shoot anyone who intervened. That night, I powerlessly witnessed one of the most horrendous acts of war. The feeling of helplessness against the barbaric practice made me stay awake during part of the night, frightened, and crying out to God. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, our neighboring country, Dr. Dennis Mukenge, a Pentecostal pastor and gynecologist specialized in helping rape victims, was one of the recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize, and he, was, he has been working hard to end sexual violence against women, especially during conflicts. In his Nobel Prize, address, he talks about hundreds of women and girls being raped as young as 18 months old. Then there are people who want to hurt women just because they can. Mubamba, a wealthy man in my parents' hometown of Dolizi, got HIV AIDS and decided to share it with as many women as he could. He would seduce a woman, have sex with her, and leave her money with the following speech. This is to bury yourself. My name is Mobamba. 
Many women died of AIDS because of him. In a report by the BBC Africa Eye on the South African township of Deep Slot, crime reporter Golden Mtika talks about his neighbor David, a serial rapist who is HIV positive and has raped about 20 women without protection. When asked if he feels good spreading HIV, he responded, quote, I feel good because I can't die alone, end of quote. The church is supposed to be a heaven for God's children, but unfortunately, that is not always the case. Women are taken advantage of by those who are in charge in youth groups and choirs. Young women are lured into sexual activities by men who seek to satisfy their own personal appetite. Rimbe, not his real name, was a pastor in one of the villages on our forced itinerary as war refugees. In the same church, there was a beautiful young mom who was struggling. Her children were sick, her husband was having an affair. She went to the pastor for prayer and help. A few days later, she came to me and said, Big Sis, I'm troubled by the pastor's solution to my problems. Basically, the pastor told her that if she slept with him, all her problems would go away. Now, let me pause here to say that in rural areas, especially, religious leaders are like teachers and doctors, men who are respected and their words are almost seen as infallible. Many villagers are not educated and they trust the leaders blindly. After a quick prayer, I asked the young woman to reason with me. So I say, pastor is married and you are married. So having sex with him is called adultery. Can sin take away sickness and bring blessing? She thought about it and she said, no. So I encouraged her, we prayed together. I shared with her some of the home remedies that we were using, praying that God will help her to stand firm. Rosie was part of our church choir when I was young in Dolizy, where we lived. The director of the choir was a good man who had organized it so that at the end of each rehearsal, every sister was accompanied home by a brother because choir ended around 8 p.m. and it was dark. One day, the person who usually took Rosie home did not come. A young man volunteered to take her home. He told her he needed to stop by his place to pick up something from his room. Rosie sat on a chair in the open bedroom while talking to the women who were pounding cassava, cooking, children, laughing outside. Suddenly, the young man closed the door, locked the room in front of everyone and raped Rosie. While she was crying for help and the women were banging at the door, calling the young man's name to release her. When he was done with his dirty deed, he took her home. He never went to prison. When Rosie told me her story, I could not believe it. It became, it, because she was such a vibrant and joyful Christian. I asked her, when, where did she get that strength? And she said, it took Jesus Christ to remove the stain of shame and guilt in my life. In a video released by Langham Partnership, Dr. Andrew Decourt, professor at Ethiopian Graduate School of Theology, says that 68.5% of Ethiopian girls, not women, girls, are sexually abused. In Ethiopia, female genital mutilation is still practiced to ensure the marriageability of girls. Dr. Sebele Daniel, one of the Langham scholars, is part of the 1% of female theologian in Ethiopia. Dr. Sebele is now fighting against what she calls, quote, the 140 traditional yet harmful and unbiblical practices still followed today, end of quote. And female genital mutilation is one of them. Women voices need to be heard all over Africa. Violence is perpetrated in the different spheres of life. The question is, how do these women protect themselves and those they love from their abusers? Well, many pray, even those who do not know Jesus, because prayer helps. Others choose to sacrifice their own safety and comfort for their children. Some fight back whenever possible, talk with other women in the same situation or with older women who have some wisdom to impart in the situation. Others bury themselves in indifference, anger, and bitterness. We cannot control what has been done to us, 
but we can control our response to violence. We can stand up against the perpetrators one way or another and not give them the satisfaction of having ruined our lives forever. African women cry out in pain for killed husbands and sons, raped daughters, abandoned babies, mistreated children, and the list goes on. All in all, when violence is done to the ones we love, violence is done to us. God is calling the church not to hide the perpetrators, but to help the victims. And the cry of my heart is to invite per persecutors to walk the Jesus walk. Are you in the church? Did you hurt someone? Well, acknowledge the wrong you have done. Turn away from sin, exercise love and respect, and even as justice needs to be done. I don't like violence and would like to see laws implemented implemented in my country and other countries to protect women and men. I pray God will raise up leaders who will help lead by example as they speak the truth. But in the meantime, I say to my sisters, remember, remember Mephibosheth ate at the king's table for the rest of his life in 2 Samuel 9. He was crippled in both feet and did not deserve the great favor bestowed upon him, but nonetheless, he received it and was blessed by it. Are you feeling crippled by life, my sister? Have you hit rock bottom? Are you feeling ugly, abused, forgotten by others? Jesus is inviting each of us to come and sit at his table and be raised to a status of daughters and sons of the King. That's our future and our destiny. Jesus washes away the abuse, the guilt, the pain, the hurt, the filth of our past. And I say to my brothers, don't just sit there and do nothing. Even a small thing is a great thing. A Congolese proverb says that when you see a snake, it will not hurt you. Either you will kill it or it will run away. Now, abuse, now that it has come out at the forefront, it's like a snake that we see. If we do nothing, it will keep on hurting women and men and children. My brothers, you need to stand up with those who are suffering. It can start by talking, taking small steps like Professor Jacques Emmanuel. Professor Jacques Emmanuel Musunga, a follower of Christ, took a stand against sex for grade, the practice that is used at the University of Brazzaville. When a female student will ask him for his help, he will counsel the student, encourage them and pray for them. Then he will say to the professors sexually harassing the student, he will say, Albertine is my niece, please don't touch her. Jeanne is my niece, please don't touch her. Sophie is my niece, please don't touch her. And so on. And some of his colleagues used to get upset. They would say, well, you have too many nieces. Of course, in Congo, everyone is your niece. But the good thing is that they will left the young woman alone. This is what one of his female students wrote. I have been deeply touched by you. You are a professor by career, but a father by nature, an example of kindness and humility. You reflect the image of Christ. There is hope for the bruised and abused, and hope is a person, and his name is Jesus. And as his people, we are part, we have a part to play. We are Jesus' feet and hand and heart to the hurting, like Professor Jacques Emmanuel Musunga. Let's do our part, heal the wounds by loving those who are hurting, speaking up against abuse and injustice. The abused women need a safe place to experience healing, and the church needs to be that place for them. My father was a safe place for me in a Congolese context where girls were, at that time, considered less than boys. God is an even safer place for all of his children. We are created for divine delight, not to be used and discarded, but to be treasured. If God, who is so mighty and powerful, our creator delights in us, how much more shall we, the body of Christ, delight in one another God's way, respect, love, affection, put the other person above yourselves? Now you might say, well, I'm neither Congolese nor African. This is not my battle. You are a child of God, so this is your battle. It is your battle too. Ask Jesus how you can help and he will show you. My hope is that you, um, what you've heard today will move something inside you and with God's help will lead you to take a step towards helping someone in need and responding to the issue of violence against women. Thank you. <music>